The aquatic three-dimensional world of Subnautica was and probably still is the most striking thing about the game. While it didn't shy away from many survival staples like cooking food, gathering materials, base building, and so on, it demonstrated a certain creativity that scratched a very unique itch in the genre. There was a constant thrill found in delving deeper and deeper, while never really knowing what horrors might be waiting for you at the bottom. The frightening nature of exploring the unknown was a big part of the appeal. It pains me to say that Subnautica Below Zero is largely a regression from the first game that often strays too far from these feelings to be a worthwhile sequel. At the end of the day, I struggle to think of reasons to play it over the original Subnautica, unless you're a super fan that's exhausted absolutely all of Subnautica 1 and now you're craving any semblance of new content. I think there's a double meaning here. Sure, Below Zero does do many things worse than its predecessor, but that could also speak to the strength of the original, and how it's difficult to meet those same standards while also trying to iterate and build upon them. As a standalone game, Below Zero isn't bad. It's not great, but it's decent. As a sequel and an expansion of the Subnautica series, however, it falls very short. My goal with this video will be to demonstrate why Subnautica Below Zero is a step backwards for the franchise due to its misplaced focus. It went in a direction that wasn't healthy to begin with and fell flat on its execution of several new ideas. That's not to say that it doesn't do anything well, but Below Zero is only at its best when it replicates the original Subnautica, and it gets worse the more it deviates from that course. As expected, this video will contain spoilers for both Subnautica and Subnautica Below Zero. I have done a critique of Subnautica, so if you'd like to hear my thoughts on that first, feel free to do so, but it isn't a necessary watch. I will be explaining some elements of the game and restating my opinions on them, such as to draw comparisons between these two titles. To reduce repetition and keep things clear, I will from now on refer to the original game as Subnautica 1 and to the sequel as just Below Zero. With all that said, thank you for joining me. Let's talk about Below Zero. So I have a question I'd like to pose to those that played Subnautica 1. Pretend that Below Zero doesn't exist for a moment, and you've just learned that Subnautica 1 is getting a sequel. How would you have liked to see the game evolve? What new things could they add to create a new and improved Subnautica experience? I ask this because I have a sneaking suspicion that Unknown Worlds Entertainment struggled to come up with an answer themselves while they were making Below Zero, because many decisions they made with this game have a shaky foundation to begin with. If you told me that the game would feature a deeper story, more land sections, and a more condensed world, I would be immediately skeptical because much of that seems like the antithesis to what made Subnautica 1 so compelling. Not every new idea in Below Zero is bad, and a handful of those new ideas have been done well, but the vast majority of them are questionable at best and terribly frustrating at worst. It's my understanding that this game had a rather tumultuous development, what with the team losing their lead writer partway through. I think many of the problems with Below Zero can be traced back to the story, which is understandable with that in mind, but it's still not something that I can just ignore and excuse the game over. One of the flaws will be apparent within 5 minutes after you start the game. In the Subnautica 1 critique, I spoke about how I felt that having a story with an end goal and conclusion was beneficial for the game even if the story itself wasn't particularly interesting or logical. You were still left to explore and discover things for yourself, but you'd always be making progress towards escaping the planet. There was always something to be working towards. And it was paced very well since there was so much freedom in how you set and achieved your goals. Below Zero takes that approach a step further by making the story one of the core facets of the game, which means that we are now playing as a fully written protagonist instead of a silent, generic Altera employee. Since the events of Subnautica 1, Altera has become more established on 4546B to survey the planet and continue their study of the Kara bacterium. One employee who participated in this endeavor was Sam Ayu, a roboticist who died under mysterious circumstances while carrying out some unknown operation. We play as her sister Robin, a scientist unaffiliated with Altera who's sneaking onto the planet in order to investigate Sam's death. I didn't expect Robin to have such a massive impact on my enjoyment of the story like she did. One of my biggest problems with this named protagonist approach in Below Zero is how it takes away from the feeling that the player is discovering and learning everything on their own. 
Robin talks to herself regularly during her adventure and thinks aloud about what she wants to do next, and these one-liners are often explicitly telling you what you should be doing or what you've just stumbled across. One of the first things she says is how she needs to get to the water and find the drop pod. These occasional quips and dialogue become less frequent the further you get into the game, but they're still there and it's amazing how it has such a drastic impact on the game's atmosphere and sense of adventure. There's a direct gameplay flaw here in that her explanations about what's going on robs the player of the opportunity to figure things out for themselves, but there's more to it than just that. There's an eerie sense of isolation in Subnautica 1 because there are literally no other humans on the planet, but also because the only voices you regularly hear are those of your deceased crew members through whatever PDAs they left behind. Regularly listening to Robin throughout Below Zero adds a comforting familiarity which takes away from the mood of the isolated environment, and it gave me a newfound appreciation for how the silent protagonist approach makes your adventure feel a lot more personal. After all, that's long been the appeal of having a silent protagonist, so the player can more easily imagine themselves in the situation and make decisions based on what they would want to do instead of what a character would want to do. Of course, solving this problem wouldn't be as easy as just flipping a switch to remove Robin's voice lines. In fact, I want to make it very clear that whenever I criticize something about any game, I'm not necessarily trying to imply a solution. Much of Below Zero is built on the fact that Robin is her own character, and that she's going through her own story separated from the players. It's too intertwined with the rest of the game to be easily solved, and I don't have the solution. I'm not a game designer. It's largely the decision to have more story emphasis that I'm disappointed by, because it's had so many negative ramifications like this one. That may seem contradictory given that I praised Subnautica 1 for making a similar decision, but the key difference here is that Subnautica 1 is much less heavy-handed with its plot. While there were important scripted events like the destruction of the Sunbeam or the meeting with the Sea Emperor Leviathan, much of the story in Subnautica 1 could be construed as the actual gameplay that you're putting the character through. Scraping together your first sea base, or frantically trying to escape a leviathan, or hauling the cyclops several hundred meters beneath the ocean. You have agency over all of these things, and they're as much a part of the character's story as they are a part of your story. These gameplay events are still present in Below Zero, but a hefty portion of the story largely consists of learning about things that already happened which you had no control over and Robin is just tying up the loose ends. It lacks the stakes and suspense of the original, despite trying to take place in the same grandeur context, that is, in a cold, unforgiving alien world. Robin is visiting 4546B with much less urgency and immediate danger, and she's doing all of this because she wants to, not because she has to. Lots of that original appeal has been lost in Robin, which is why I feel very strongly that the story is a big symptom of the game's larger misdirection. Even if the story itself was well written, which I'm about to argue that it isn't, it would still heavily detract from the unique strengths of Subnautica. The premise and gameplay is very well suited for a tale of bitter survival, which Subnautica 1 capitalizes on much better than Below Zero does. As for the quality of writing itself, I can't say that I am an expert in storytelling, but I can still identify places where Below Zero's writing falters. One somewhat puzzling aspect is how Robin's investigation into Sam's death very quickly becomes sidelined in favor of two other firmly distinct storylines that have little to do with each other. While the player starts the game out under the notion that they're here to learn about Sam, Marguerite and Alan are also competing for your attention and time. I'll be talking about all three of these plot lines, starting with Sam. Sam's story suffers from a lack of clarity about what actually happens to her, which isn't helped by the fact that her quest line is completely optional. Now that I've written it out, I realize how ridiculous it sounds considering Robin's motivations to begin with. She came to 4546B so she could learn about what happened to her sister, but you can beat the game without ever reaching a conclusion. I go as far as to say that it's actually very easy to miss Sam's story given how poorly the land-based exploration has been handled. More on that later though, one of the consequences of the story being about events that already happened is that you have to take a tell-don't-show approach that doesn't necessarily mix well with the non-linear explorative gameplay. All of your discoveries about Sam are made through listening to PDA devices as you come across them, and depending on the order that you complete things in, some of these PDAs will be missing context that makes them hard to follow until you find another PDA elsewhere to fill in those gaps. 
There may be long gameplay stretches between discovering important PDAs where you'll forget about the last thing you learned, and you either have to sift through the databank trying to see how all of these puzzle pieces fit together, or just try to commit heaps of vague information to memory. The result is a confusing web of dialogue that doesn't neatly explain what happened to Sam, even after you discover the final cave with the frozen leviathan where she died. The fact that her story is told entirely through PDAs has made me question whether a text log would be beneficial for games with vague stories or not. I used to be in the camp that they would be in most cases, but now I'm not so sure. It's difficult to make such a system manageable when you have hundreds of lines of dialogue you need to organize, and Below Zero demonstrates how frustrating it can be to dig up whatever information you're looking for. For example, one of the reasons I think I got lost so often in the Glacial Basin was because I couldn't exactly tell or remember what I was looking for to begin with. I found pretty much every PDA with hints about the Frozen Leviathan pretty early in the game, so 15 hours later when I got to Phi Research, all I had was a faint, hazy memory of some logs about Sam doing something with a Leviathan. This resulted in some lengthy sessions of just looking at all of the databank messages trying to find the information I was looking for, because I knew it was in there, I just couldn't remember where it was and how it might relate to the current situation. It's not a very clean or elegant method to tell a story. The good news, if you could call it that, is that Sam's story isn't nearly interesting enough to warrant the stress of trying to uncover it. If I was playing Below Zero with the hindsight I had now, I would just ignore it, knowing that most of it is a waste of time. From what I've been able to gather, Sam and her team discovered that this frozen leviathan was infected with the Kara, and that Altero was performing some kind of experiments on it for a malicious purpose. In an effort to stop them, Sam created an antidote that could cure the Leviathan in order to halt their research, but instead of doing that, she decided to hide the antidote and blow up the cave where the Leviathan was for reasons that I do not understand. She ended up accidentally dying in the explosion, which didn't do anything for her cause anyway. Robin can still find the cave and the infected Leviathan intact when you explore the glacial basin. This story makes less and less sense the more I think about it, but it isn't worth the effort of yammering on about plot holes for the next 10 minutes because, as I mentioned earlier, even if the story was more cohesive and well written, the damage would already be done. It just doesn't suit the gameplay. It's also strange to me that lots of Robin and Sam's dialogue is alluding to her death as being suspicious and that Altera is covering it up, only to have that potential ripped away by making Sam die due to her own negligence, as if the game wasn't sure what it wanted its own themes to be. Marguerite's story has a strange lack of attention, to the point where it feels like her presence is just unnecessary. She was one of the survivors of the Degasi mission that happened 10 years before the events of Subnautica 1. In that game, there's quite an elaborate series of PDAs that log her survival with Paul and Bart Torgal, and it's one of the more compelling side stories. Once again though, the weight of these events is compromised just by Marguerite being alive to begin with. All three of them should have died to the Kara. I wonder if including her to create a more direct connection with Subnautica 1 was a worthy enough trade-off that the developers were willing to just bring her back despite how nonsensical it is. I disagree with that decision, since a big part of Marguerite's appeal was how her headstrong and reckless nature clashed with the more cautious, pragmatic attitudes of Paul and Bart, yet it was in their best interest to work together in spite of those differences and form an unlikely team of survivors. Now that Marguerite's on her own, she doesn't add much value to anything. It's possible that she influenced Sam to blow up the cave, I guess, so maybe she's supposed to be some kind of villain, but if that's true, then it makes no sense for Robin to be so nonchalant towards her. Her feelings towards her deceased crewmates are never explored either, and all we really learn about her past is the absurd notion that she had to float through the ocean inside the decaying body of a reaper leviathan until she made it back to land. Frankly, it stretches the believability of her survival so far that it almost seems like a joke. I wish I had more to say on her, but I don't. There's nothing particularly remarkable which, again, fails to justify the game's direction towards greater story emphasis. As for Alan, the final plotline a part of this concoction, he's the one with the most involved story since it coaxes you to explore the planet more than the others. I think there was some potential here when he was first introduced, but at the risk of sounding petty here, his dialogue is so unbearably snide and obnoxious that I grew to hate him. The conversations he has with Robin feel so lifeless, as if they have to constantly remind us that Alan is an alien who doesn't understand how humans work. 
there are several times when he's used as a vehicle for Robin to make some shoehorned philosophical musings about human nature that rarely feel relevant to the current situation. The relationship between the two doesn't evolve naturally at all over the course of the game. Robin starts out by trying to ignore him, then agrees to help him, and by the end, after very minimal bonding, she's willing to uproot her entire life and travel with him to another planet to meet the rest of the architects. I really dislike Alan's character and story for these reasons, but I will concede that at least he doesn't have as many negative impacts on gameplay as the other two stories do. He's sort of the equivalent to the radio from Subnautica 1. Every now and then he'll alert you to a new alien artifact somewhere in the ocean that you should go scan, and in doing so, you'll get to explore some new biomes and areas that would be harder to find naturally. Much like in Subnautica 1, I appreciate how these signals are relatively unassuming reminders about what you could be doing next without forcing you into it. The verticality offered by 4546B means that stumbling about until you find everything on your own could be a painstaking chore. A lack of a minimap makes navigation quite difficult, but these signals are helpful as points of reference to guide you into finding landmarks. It would be quite challenging to find everything on your own if you were just left to your own devices the entire time. I still wish there was an alternative to Alan that could serve this role instead since I find him so grating, but that's a problem with the character and not the system itself. I didn't find Alan's actual story any more or less engaging than Sam or Marguerite's. His is certainly more awkwardly paced though. You don't really learn anything significant about him until the end when they drop the bomb that he's the architect responsible for accidentally letting the Kara out of containment in the first place. This intergalactic pandemic started because of his mistake and he wants to seek out whatever architects are still alive so that he can make amends. It's a pretty big revelation, but once again, the dialogue between him and Robin is so robotic that there wasn't any weight to such an important narrative moment. Finding this out also marks the finale of the game, which makes for a very underwhelming ending since it ends on a cliffhanger. There's not the same sense of achievement derived from building the Neptune and escaping like in Subnautica 1. I'm a bit worried that Subnautica 3 is going to follow in these footsteps and continue with Robin and Alan's story. That's part of why I wanted to highlight why Below Zero's story was a mistake. Constant dialogue from the protagonist defeats much of the enjoyment in discovering the planet yourself, and executing a more concrete plot well is difficult to do when the premise of Subnautica lends itself much better to embracing player agency and immersion in a world. I would imagine that most people enjoy Subnautica more for the deep sea diving experience and less for the story, so it's puzzling that both seem to have had an equal share of attention. On the bright side, the core exploratory parts of Subnautica 1 are intact in Below Zero, and much of the underwater gameplay is just more Subnautica. What I struggle with here is deciding how much these similarities should factor in when it comes to appraising Below Zero, and whether it's different enough to have warranted an entirely new game. I'll reiterate how I feel about Subnautica 1's exploration because pretty much all of it applies to Below Zero as well. Navigating the ocean and soaking in the environment is one of the best things about the game. It can get a little tiring when you have to wander around looking for blueprint parts to scan, but for the most part the world was very carefully constructed and each of the biomes were a visual delight. I spoke about this a bit already, but I'll mention it again. The fear factor of being underwater is an emotion utilized by the Subnautica games very uniquely and very well. Whether that be swimming hundreds of meters deep where light can't penetrate the water, or floating near the surface with the looming anxiety of a predator reaching up to snap you under the water. The unpredictable nature of an alien environment can make that navigation downright terrifying at times, doubly so if you're someone who gets a bit uncomfortable when faced with huge bodies of water, which I think affects more people than one might expect. I know I felt that way whenever I listened to the ominous groans of monsters echo throughout the water without any way to pinpoint where they might be. In some ways, Below Zero is an improvement on Subnautica 1's exploration, and in other ways, it's a regression. But in the big picture, it's extremely similar. 
Some of the fauna that you find is the same, some of the biomes look very alike, and it plays to all of the same fears that Subnautica 1 did. In fact, part of me wonders how much of the Below Zero experience is soured by previous exposure to the same atmosphere. The game is almost definitely less scary if you play Subnautica 1 first. Whether that should be viewed as a flaw of Below Zero, or as unknown worlds exhibiting the same talents they demonstrated previously, I can't say for sure. Nevertheless, it would only be fair for me to highlight some strengths that Below Zero has over the first game, because there are some. Below Zero's world is definitely smaller, both horizontally and vertically, which I thought would be a negative at first, but it's grown on me the more I've thought about it, and I think Below Zero's Sector Zero is just as strong of a setting as Subnautica 1's Crater. Condensing the world sounds like it would run contrary to the expansive abyssal void that Subnautica 1 did so well, but there are some other benefits that come with it to offset that loss. The first is that Below Zero feels more claustrophobic, which is different, but still just as strong as the emotions evoked by Subnautica 1. Many biomes have rather narrow entry points that are tricky to navigate your vehicles through, and there's a subtle worry that you'll end up getting stuck down there after losing your way through the twisted caverns and crevices. Subnautica 1 has things like this too, but they're fewer in number, which was a bit of missed potential. Below Zero realizes that potential much better, and it was occasionally more stressful than Subnautica 1 because I always knew that I'd have to claw my way out of whatever cave I was exploring when I wanted to return home. This is compounded further by the underwater vehicles lacking the mobility that the Seamoth offered, which is no longer present in Below Zero. The Sea Truck is a bulkier, slower replacement that struggles with precise movements, especially as you add more components to it, and figuring out how to maneuver it through all of the narrow passageways can make for a valuable experience. The game also experiments with this idea by kind of bringing back Rex from Subnautica 1, just with much less frequency, but much more intricate construction. There's a large spaceship that crashed near the Lilypad Islands that can be thoroughly explored once you get the laser cutter, and it felt a bit maze-like with how easy it is to get spun around and lost throughout its rooms and corridors. I mentioned in the Subnautica 1 critique that exploring wrecks was enjoyable, but many of them were relatively small and simplistic. The Mercury 2 helps address this and can incite some panic when you realize you are low on oxygen and can't find your way out. The presence of oxygen plants throughout these areas can partially break the tension in these moments since there's so many, and I think the game could have done with removing some of them, but that's a relatively minor nitpick. There is a noticeable lack of a massive seafaring vehicle as an equivalent to the Cyclops, since it probably wouldn't work well in these tighter environments. This is a little bit disappointing considering how exciting it was to get your first Cyclops, and while I really do miss that thing, I think the Sea Truck is a clever middle ground between that and the Sea Moth that works well in a smaller world. Having the Cyclops act as a mobile base was a fantastic feature of Subnautica 1, but you don't need to travel as far in Below Zero, which means that such a vehicle would lose most of its utility, and it straight up wouldn't be able to fit in some of the deeper biomes. The Sea Truck is here to fill a similar role, while still being able to serve as a quick general use vehicle. It starts out as a small little submersible, but you can unlock a pretty expansive list of modular components that can be connected together to make the Sea Truck bigger. Along with some of their own unique capabilities, these pieces bring back many of the features that the Cyclops had. You can get rooms to hold storage, as well as a component to attach your prawn suit to and carry it around with you. I wasn't a huge fan of how the thing controlled when I started out, and even now part of me feels like you run into things too easily, but overall I think it's a creative, suitable idea for the game that nicely compresses several functions into a single vehicle. A smaller world also means that certain exploratory moments can have more weight, since there's fewer of them throughout the game. For example, in Subnautica 1, there are quite a few Reaper Leviathans spread throughout the world that are very intimidating when you first encounter them, but quickly lose their dangerous status when you start finding them semi-regularly, and thus can deal with them without much trouble. In Below Zero, the rate at which you encounter Leviathans is much slower, which I think suits the game better since finding one can be seen as a grand event-like encounter to make these monsters seem more special. There are only two types of underwater leviathans in Below Zero, and one of them is saved for close to the end of the game. As you're descending into the Crystal Caves, your PDA will warn you that a Shadow Leviathan is nearby and that you need to be careful.
When you actually spot it in the distance as it worms in your general direction, it reminded me of the same fears I had when spotting a reaper from afar for the first time in Subnautica 1. In fact, it felt even more impactful this time since the game was lacking in memorable leviathans until now and I enjoyed them being used that way more than the way Subnautica 1 did things. They're occasional, monstrous threats that have a more prestigious status, instead of enemies that just feel like another part of the larger ecosystem. Another problem that gets partially solved by a smaller world is that you're doing less aimless wandering to search for blueprints, which means less dead exploration time. Unfortunately, this one comes with a few caveats. The game's pacing is considerably faster than Subnautica 1, demonstrated by the fact that you can beat the game in half the amount of time. Because of that, I have a nagging feeling that the game is too short and lacking content, so much so that you can kind of tell this was originally planned as DLC. I generally like that the smaller world means higher density of resources and fragments in each area, but there was very little added in the way of new tools and items to craft, so even though you're progressing faster, you aren't really working towards anything new other than the story. This is part of what I mean when I say it's hard to see reasons to play Below Zero over Subnautica 1. If the games offer more or less the same thing in the way of exploration and items, the only major unique thing that Below Zero offers so far are its cumbersome plot lines. The biomes you find in Below Zero are unique to the game, and they do have more vibrant colors to make things look prettier, but it isn't worth trudging through all of the other non-exploration content in order to experience it. Once again, a lack of new content could be pinned on the story. If the game is concentrated around the story, then the game's length is partially going to depend on how much the writers can think of including. If we wanted to add more content to Below Zero without squeezing it into an already condensed package, the story would have to be stretched over a longer runtime, which means more confusing PDAs, more confusing plot holes, and more unsatisfying developments between Robin and Alan. If having more intricate stories is very important to the developers, then that's fine, but they would need to break away from some of the core gameplay elements to make it work. As it stands now, I would have been happy to accept the game as being another Escape the Planet story if it meant that more interesting things could have been added without having to work around three flimsy plot lines. This could incite a discussion about what people should reasonably expect out of sequels to games. Are we content with just more of the same, or do we expect a game to build upon itself while solving some problems of its previous installment? There is no universally correct approach, but generally speaking, if you're in the first camp where you're happy if a sequel just gives us more of the same, then you'll probably view Below Zero more favorably than I do. The spirit is still there, it just comes with more baggage. If you're more interested in seeing new iterations of things though, then you're more likely to be left unsatisfied. I could have gotten a similar and probably better experience out of just revisiting Subnautica 1 again. If the core gameplay is really good without any clear room for improvement, then I think there's more merit in a sequel just being an expansion of the same thing, and honestly, Below Zero probably could have gotten away with that if it did more to address Subnautica 1's major issues, but it doesn't. On that subject, there are a few examples I'd like to talk about of places where Below Zero could and should have improved on its foundation. Inventory management. This is up first because it's the biggest one. I grew to hate inventory management in Subnautica 1, and I was sorely disappointed that Below Zero does basically nothing to change how it works. A quick laundry list of complaints that I have are very small inventory space for what you're expected to collect, no way to quickly tell which items are in which lockers, no options for large-scale storage, and the return of the horrible floating lockers that you're stuck using until you can build a base. Pretty much all of these things are still issues in Below Zero, despite some paltry attempts to remedy them. You can pin crafting recipes now and have them always shown in the UI, which is a great idea, but I really wish they took this a step further and implemented a search bar in the blueprint screen so you can quickly find what you're looking for. Sometimes the daunting list of crafting recipes can just sort of blur together, and you have a hard time finding what you're looking for. Maybe this is my fault for being unobservant though, so please let me know if you've had a similar experience. I'd be interested to know. I thought the quantum lockers would solve many of these problems by creating a large centralized storage that could be expanded upon the more lockers you placed on the ground, but all it does is offer a measly 16 spaces of storage that can be accessed from any quantum locker. Lots of games have an equivalent to this, it's like the piggy bank in Terraria for example. Unfortunately, its usefulness is outweighed by inconvenience because 1. you have to drop it every time you need to access something, and 2. it can't be used inside your sea base at all. You have to carry it around. 
and those 16 spaces are effectively 12 spaces if you decide to use this locker as expanded inventory space, which as far as I can see is the only practical use for it. I'm very irritated by this because it really misses the point of why inventory management in Subnautica 1 was so annoying. If creating multiple quantum lockers would expand their storage space, or if there was a way to link them to regular lockers or something like that, then we'd be talking. This would be somewhat similar to how the magic storage mod works in Terraria, which is the best storage solution I've ever seen in games where you're expected to carry so many resources. You can place down a single chest and expand its capacity as much as you want through connecting it to external storage units. It puts everything in a single place and comes with automatic sorting, a search bar, and lots of other great quality of life features that makes managing items relatively painless. On that subject, bulk collection of resources could still be improved. Similar to Subnautica 1, I always felt that I had a titanium shortage in Below Zero, and it was harder to collect large volumes of it this time since there's no metal salvage near your drop pod, you have to travel a fair bit to find it. The mineral detector is a good idea to help address this, but it's not quite enough in my opinion, mainly because it isn't super well equipped to alert when something is above or below you. It's better at scanning for things more horizontally. Moreover, the fact that you need to hold so much of certain resources has made me wonder whether a hard and fast no stacking rule is really appropriate. I've almost been tipped to the side of stacking in some capacity being favorable, even if it was pretty limited, but I'm equally cautious making that claim because it would make storage space less valuable overall, which can inadvertently affect how you base build or how you operate your sea truck or several other things. I'd be interested to hear some opinions on this. All of the rules around storage seem built on the fact that there is no stacking, so naturally it would be a very big change to introduce. At the same time, I really wish that managing large resource volumes was somehow made easier, because as it stands now, I do think that it can affect how you interact with other components of the game. For example, the hefty titanium requirements may be a subtle deterrent that makes more extensive base building seem unappealing. If anyone has any more thoughts on this, please let me know. I really do wonder if stacking would be good for the game or not. The last possible improvement that I want to talk about is the issue of the lack of immediate threat from leviathans. I still don't really like how underwhelming they are once you actually get up close with them. It's always a little bit cool to get rattled around in your vehicle while they stare you down, but their damage is pretty pitiful and it serves as a minor nuisance rather than something you should be actively avoiding. This was an issue in Subnautica 1 too, especially with the sea dragons who just look a little bit silly when you're up close. I was hopeful that this would also be improved when encountering the Shadow Leviathan, but unfortunately it's another case of all bark and no bite. The things are decently aggressive and will chase you down, but they only do 20 or 30 damage to your prawn or sea truck, and finding a safe spot really isn't that difficult. This really cheapens how scary leviathans are after the initial encounter, but I could also understand a hesitation to make them more punishing since their grab hitboxes and behavior is a little bit janky. The transitions to being grabbed aren't very smooth, and it would be intensely frustrating to have your vehicles get easily destroyed when you're this deep in the ocean. If they could kill you in just a couple of attacks, it would feel straight up unfair. As a result, this problem might simply boil down to poor implementation of Leviathan AI and behavior. If we wanted Leviathans to pose a more immediate threat, there would need to be quite a few technical improvements made to how they work. The entire game is honestly kind of janky, so it wouldn't surprise me if getting other details right took precedence over making Leviathans feel right, especially considering how infrequently they're encountered. There is one other thing that needed to be improved from Subnautica 1, but it's a lot more imperative to the Below Zero experience, so I think it warrants its own section. The increased emphasis of land exploration, particularly around the Glacial Basin, is close to my biggest gripe with the game. Much like the story, it's a prime example of the game's misdirection, something that feels blatantly unnecessary to begin with and is made worse by shoddy execution. In Subnautica 1, there are a handful of land sections, but they happen in relatively simple environments and you don't spend a very long time in them. The two examples that stick out in my memory are when you first travel to the floating island and when you explore the demolished aurora. Both of these sections suffer from the fact that walking around on land in Subnautica 1 just doesn't feel right. It's abundantly clear that more effort was put into the swimming and underwater vehicle controls. 
It's much more wise for the developers to direct their attention towards the water sections since that's the main appeal of the game, and the awkward land movement is at least somewhat tolerable since they feel more like novelty moments instead of being deeply ingrained with the game. Sure, exploring the Aurora is a prerequisite to building the Neptune rocket, but the unique environment and context of the crashed ship is worth experiencing once even if you have to deal with the awkward land movement. It also isn't entirely ground-based like the floating island is. There's some shallow dives thrown into the mix, which makes the experience a bit more memorable. Between Subnautica 1 and Below Zero, it's probably the best land section. Land movement in Below Zero feels identically clunky to that of Subnautica 1, but it's been given a greater emphasis and also has some other roadblocks thrown in that largely detract from the experience. The Glacial Basin, where Sam's story conclusion takes place, is almost entirely done on land, and there's another instance where you have to find Marguerite's greenhouse hidden somewhere atop an iceberg. The best way that I can describe the controls of running around on land is that it feels like the character never takes off their flippers. Robin gets stuck on uneven terrain so easily to the point where you can get stuck just trying to walk up the ramp and leave your base. It's honestly nonsensical to me that things like the Glacial Basin exist when no effort has been made to improve the game on this front. It's like an intentional exacerbation of what Subnautica has done poorly. This is compounded by the fact that Below Zero brings in some extremely confusing navigation without giving you any tools to make things easier for yourself. Frequent storms can occur while you're on the surface, and not only do they completely obstruct your vision, they also require you to halt whatever you're doing and find a cave to take shelter in, or jump back into the water and wait for it to blow over. If you stay outside, your body temperature will drop very rapidly. I'm not exaggerating when I say it felt like blizzards would come and go every two minutes, and I was rolling my eyes every time I heard the words Dangerous weather approaching. Seek shelter. Dangerous weather approaching. Seek shelter. Dangerous weather approaching. Seek shelter. Seek shelter. Seek shelter. Seek shelter. Seek shelter. Imminent. These storms will constantly kill your momentum, something I especially notice when trying to find Marguerite's greenhouse. The only hint that you're given is that she's about a kilometer north from Delta Island, and when you go there, there's several towering icebergs with their own entry points, and you have to figure out which one of them she's on. I'm not sure if they intended to make this such a frustrating task, because once you know the route it's actually pretty simple, but the constant snowstorms means that it's near impossible to survey your surroundings or scout from atop the other icebergs. If body temperature wasn't such a limiting factor, you could just wait for the storms to pass, but if you don't go through the trouble of building a snow fox here, which I would argue isn't helpful anyway since these icebergs are more like scattered islands instead of one large landmass, then you're going to be constantly jumping back into the water even when you feel like you're going in the right direction. Something you could craft that improves your vision in these snowstorms could have worked well here. Not only would it make these sections less obnoxious, it would also help in adding more unique items to Below Zero, and introduce the problem-solving elements that can be found in the underwater sections. All in all, it's just very poorly thought out. The Glacial Basin is even worse. Exploring that area before you get the Cold Suit and Snow Fox is miserable, and I have no idea how the game went through such an extensive early access period only for that section to end up in the state that it's in. Even after you get the right equipment, the basin still suffers from poor level design that makes finding the Frozen Leviathan's Cave a very cumbersome task. It's extremely difficult to wayfind since pretty much the entire area looks the same. There's few visual indicators that you can use to mark places you've already been, and the generous amounts of branching paths, caves, and loops makes it incredibly confusing to keep track of everything in your head. It's not confusing in a way that allows for reasonable problem solving. There's a lot of guesswork involved in figuring out where you have or haven't been already. The map of the Glacial Basin is really the only tool that you're given, but it doesn't actually tell you where the Frozen Leviathan Cave is, and it also doesn't properly convey the different vertical levels and cliffs that you can find in the biome. The one saving grace is having the purple trees indicated very clearly so that you know where you are once you've found them, but as far as following the actual path goes, it's not very helpful. It also does nothing to help with the fact that blizzards will prevent you from being able to see anything at all, even when trying to follow the map. Given that it's the longest land section, it suffers the most from the general, unwieldy land-based movement. When I realized that the Snow Fox was a land vehicle, I was immediately suspicious because how could they execute a hoverbike properly when just walking around is still an issue? 
I don't think I was wrong to have these concerns because the Snow Fox is just as awkward as moving on foot, if not worse. The speed boost just straight up doesn't work sometimes, and it's equally bad at handling uneven terrain. It does solve one problem though. Similar to how the Sea Truck or Prawn are mobile oxygen sources, the Snow Fox is a mobile heat source and you don't lose body temperature while riding it, meaning you can use it to easily wait up blizzards so that they're less disruptive. It's a remedy to a problem that shouldn't exist to begin with, but at least it's something. I almost don't even want to talk about how terrible the Ice Worm section is because I feel like I'm close to straying off course and just ranting about problems that everyone has already identified. All I'll say is that the Ice Worm is so unpolished that I thought my game was glitching for the entire encounter until I read online that everybody gets thrown off their Snow Fox in the same awkward manner. I'm going to let the game footage speak for itself a little bit while I try to wrap up the broader problems here. Much of this could come off as me complaining that the game is too difficult, or that I'm shunning it for presenting the player with a realistic, challenging scenario that makes survival harder. The underwater sections do that regularly, and they're all very well done, so why are the land sections so different? I hope I've been able to establish why they're problematic on a mechanical level, but the other issue is that there's nothing of value to be found by putting up with all of this. The only reason to explore the glacial basin or the icebergs is to see Sam and Marguerite's conclusions, neither of which are well written to begin with. You also have to put up with the ice worm to reach Alan's conclusion and beat the game, so really, the only reason you would play the game this far is to finish the story. The only unique items and tools for you to synthesize are ones that are restricted to land use anyway, those being the snow fox and the spy pangling. In short, the game is just straight up unrewarding. The challenges that Subnautica 1 presented in comparison felt much more fulfilling to overcome, and even though its conclusion wasn't done perfectly either, actually reaching that point was less of a slog, and it was a smaller portion of the game overall since the experience was stretched out. Below Zero has a 20-25 to 25 hour runtime, and it simply doesn't reflect very well on the game when at least 20% of that time is spent either dealing with awkward ground movement or trying to absorb some haphazard story information. By this point, the only other relatively major thing that Below Zero does differently are the changes to how the ocean is constructed, that is, shrinking it in size and making everything more tightly packed as a result. That's the only time when Below Zero experiments more with Subnautica's core gameplay features and tries to build on them. The remaining content is very poorly executed and not at all what Subnautica 1 needed to improve. I very much respect the desire to push boundaries and innovate on what a game does previously, but the unfortunate reality is that sometimes you can innovate in places where it isn't necessary. I think that's the main lesson to be taken away here. Below Zero demonstrates the difficulty found in creating a direct sequel that wants to stand on the shoulders of something that was already so well done. If there's one mistake I made in my Subnautica 1 critique, it's that it came off as too negative. Because while the game did have some pretty big problems, playing Below Zero shed some more light on all of the unique strengths it had in the survival genre. Below Zero rehashes all of those feelings, which is a good thing on its own, but it comes with so much bloat that you're better off just wringing out Subnautica 1 of absolutely everything that it offers. If both games provide a deep sea diving experience, but one of them only utilizes it for half the time, it's easy to see which is the more favorable of the two. I really do wonder what direction Subnautica 3 will go in, and what kind of lessons Unknown Worlds have learned from their work on Below Zero. All I can hope for is that they're now more keenly aware of what the strengths and weaknesses of their franchise are, because while they got a whole lot right with Subnautica 1, they got even more wrong with Below Zero. If Subnautica 3 is mostly a return to form, I think that would be a good place to start. If it ends up being a continuation of Robin and Alan's adventure, I can't help but approach it with less enthusiasm. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, feel free to do the whole subscribe, like, and comment. It's all free and it really does help out. I'm also always very open to hearing feedback, so please don't hesitate to let me know what you thought of the video. I hope to see you for the next one.